Good evening, everyone. I'm Greg Gumbel. Welcome to our New York studios in the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. Tonight, CBS Sports tips off its 26th consecutive year covering March Madness. From the first round games all the way to the trophy presentation, CBS is your home for the emotion and excitement unique to the NCAA Basketball Tournament. Now, just a short while ago, the chair, Gary Walters, and Division I Men's Basketball Committee adjourned after finishing up this year's tournament brackets. I am joined by my partners, Clark Kellogg, and Seth Davis, um, let's shall go. we? No, let's go. Exhausted let's already. Go. Start. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's time to get out your bracket sheets, sharpen your pencils. Coming up, we'll bring you the exclusive live announcement of the seedings and pairings for the 2007 tournament, and our experts will review the field once it's set. And after that, we will talk live with the chair of the selection committee, Gary Walters. First, let's review some basics. 65 available tournament bids. 31 go automatically to conference champions, leaving 34 at-large bids. An opening round game will be played in Dayton Tuesday night to narrow the field to 64 teams. In addition, the committee always makes an effort to keep as many teams as possible close to home for their first and second round games. This year, the brackets return to their traditional designations by region, the East the Midwest, the South, and the West. And as usual, the committee has ranked the four number one teams to set up a potential final for where if they all make it, the overall number one seed would play the fourth number one seed in one national semifinal with the second and third number one seeds potentially matching up against each other. With that in mind, let's look at this year's number one seeds. In the Midwest, the number one overall seed, the Florida Gators. First number one seed in school history for Florida. They won their first outright SEC regular season title since 1989 and won their third straight SEC tournament earlier today with a win over Arkansas. They're looking to become the first team since Duke repeat as national champs. The number two number one seed is North Carolina's Tar Heels and they're number one in the East. They won a share of the ACC regular season championship, won their first ACC tournament title in nine years, the 11th time the Tar Heels have been a number one. We move to the South. In the South, the number one seed, the Buckeyes of Ohio State, the third time Ohio State has been a number one. They're the winners of the regular season Big Ten Championship. They won the Big Ten Tournament title today with a victory over the Wisconsin Badgers. They were ranked number one for the first time since 1962. Ohio State, a number one seed. And the fourth number one will be out west, and that'll be... For it, wait for it, the Kansas Jayhawks. Seventh time the Jayhawks are number one. They won the Big 12 regular season title. They defeat Florida along the way, and they won their second consecutive Big 12 tournament. The Kansas Jayhawks, a number one seed, and a eh, reason to celebrate once again today. 30 and 4 on the year, 14 and 12 in the Big 12. Now, here's how the regions shape up based upon where the four number one seeds have been assigned. The winner of the Midwest region will meet the winner of the West region in one national semifinal game. The other semifinal will pit the winner of the East region against the winner of the South region. And you will see those games from Atlanta on Final Four Saturday, the 31st of March, beginning at 6, 6 Eastern time here on CBS. And then Monday night, April the 2nd, CBS Sports will present the national championship game at 9 Eastern time. We've been talking about these number one seeds for a couple of weeks now. Now, what do you think? No, I'm not surprised. I mean, Kansas obviously was just one that I didn't have there, but you clearly knew there were four, six potential number one seeds fighting for four spots. And Florida, based on what the committee felt and, and kind of what I felt, they deserved to be the overall number one. And I had the other three on North Carolina and Ohio State. I don't think much surprised. And they've been saying uh, how important conference tournaments were going to be. All four number one seeds won their conference tournament champions. Uh, three of those teams won their regular season uh, championships. I'm sure that UCLA is a little bit disappointed based on their whole body of work, but uh, you can only have four number one seasons as much as we've tried to get everybody in. <laughs> All right, guys, let's bring in uh, Jim Nance and Billy Packer, who join us from Chicago, where they just called the Big Ten championship game. Jim? Thank you, Greg, and uh, 
You know, Billy, I think this year the conference tournaments and the importance of the conference tournament really shows in the number one seats. Jim, I can think back a few years ago when coaches would stipulate and say, you know, it might be best not to maybe get knocked out in the second round of your postseason conference tournament. I think Gary Walters, chairman of the committee, let us know last week that he's going to look at these postseason conference tournaments maybe just as much as the regular season because it is winding down and so many teams are we're even. And it looks like it's quite obvious that UCLA getting bumped out right away knocked them off that number one line. We speculate it all afternoon on the Big Ten final. Would it be Ohio State perhaps as the number one overall seed of the tournament? They end up number three. I like the fact that Florida here, you got the whole team coming back, this incredible gang coming back after winning the championship last year. What a hook, what a story going into the tournament. They're number one overall. I think that it was a reflection to Noah's post-game interview. He said <laughs> nobody's given us any credit and he jumps right out there and, and now he, he has nothing that he can say. But in my estimation and here's where I do credit the committee. If you're a basketball coach in a college level yes. and you say what team would the team you'd not like to face in, in, in the NCAA tournament it is Florida a veteran team and without without question I think the best team in college basketball who now people have to prove they can beat them. and definitely they are the story of the tournament as we get this one started and Greg let's go back to you in New York Jim Billy thank you much we'll see you a bit later in the show get your thoughts on the entire bracket incidentally if you're stuck in your office this week can't get to a TV sign up for NCAA March Madness on demand and watch the men's tournament online get your free VIP IP pass now at NCAAsports.com slash MMOD. The NCAA tournament, truly a national event. These are the 13 cities across the country where this year's games will be played. And college teams and fans have gathered from coast to coast. Some waiting to see if they're in, others waiting to see whom they will play. Coming up, we'll reveal the Midwest region when the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show continues on CBS. CBS Sports NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show is sponsored by Powerade. Sport is what you make it. Singular, raising the bar. And by State Farm. Great service, great rates, it's all here. Nobody takes care of you like State Farm. Welcome back to our New York studios, everyone. We're ready to begin revealing the seedings and the pairings. Here is a look at the tournament brackets from the NCAA and its corporate champion, Coca-Cola. We begin with the Midwest region. These games to be played in New Orleans, Louisiana, March 16 and 18. We begin with the top seed, Florida Gators, looking to become back-to-back -back champions for the first time in 15 years. They'll take on the number 16 seed, the Tigers of Jackson State. The SWAC tournament title champions with the automatic bid. The number eight seed, the Wildcats of Arizona. Lute Olson makes it 23 straight tournament appearances. That ties Dean Smith for the longest run ever. They will meet out of the Big Ten. The Boilermakers of Purdue, 16 and one at home on the season, 21 and 11 on the year. In Buffalo, New York, March 15th and 17th, the number 15, the number five seed, Butler Bulldogs. Todd Licklider, Horizon Coach of the Year for a second straight year. They want to share the Horizon regular season title. They will meet the number 12 seed Old Dominion Monarchs out of the Colonial League. And they come in winning 12 of their last 13 games. And the Monarchs of ODU on 24 and 8. A happy bunch of campers, 15 and 3 in the Colonial. The number four seed, the Terps of Maryland out of the ACC. They won it all back in 2002, finished strong. They are 24 and eight on the year. They'll meet the Wildcats of Davidson with the automatic bid out of the Southern Conference. They won the regular season and Southern Conference Tournament Championship. In Chicago on March 16 and 18, the number two seed, Wisconsin Badgers. 22 game home win streak. They won't be home, but they'll be close in Chicago. The Badgers of Wisconsin at 29 and 5, runners up in today's Big Ten Tournament Championship game. And they will meet the number 15 seeded Islanders of Texas AM Corpus Christi, their first ever tournament appearance, winning the Southland today. The number seven seed will be the Running Rebels of UNLV coming out of the Mountain West, winning the tournament championship. And the Running Rebels are sitting there waiting to see. And there you are, guys. 28 and 6 on the year. Now, who will you play? Coming out of the ACC, it'll be the Yellow Jackets of Georgia Tech. Key wins this week, this year over Duke, North Carolina. They finished the season winning seven of their last 10 games. March 16th and 18th in Spokane, Washington. Talk about a dangerous team. The Ducks of Oregon. 
They won the first ever NCAA championship back in 1939, and they won the Pac-10 tournament this year. They'll play the Red Hawks of Miami. They won the MAC tournament championship on a last second shot last night. The number six seed will be the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. And Big East Coach of the Year, Mike Bray, leading the way. We talked to him a short while ago, wanted to know where they're going to go. That's where you're headed. Who are you going to play? Coming out of the Big South, the Eagles of Winthrop. A school record 28 wins this year. They come into the tournament on an 18-game winning streak, and they won the Big South Conference Tournament Championship. So there is the Midwest region bracket. And uh, guys, let's take a look now from top to bottom and figure out what you see, Clark. Well, I tell you what, you consider the fact that a lot of people would think that Butler and ODU, Old Dominion, would be potential bracket buster type teams. They're going to face each other in the first <laughs> round in that classic 5-12 matchup. Terrific opportunity. That Maryland-Davidson game. Davidson really free flows offensively and can shoot it. Maryland, one of the hotter teams coming into the tournament. Yeah, we're talking about a Purdue as a bubble team. I guess not. You look at them as a nine seed. They got in with uh, plenty of room to spare. Uh, I actually kind of like Old Dominion to beat Butler in that game, and uh, the Terps obviously can advance uh, pretty far into the tournament, if, but the, for the fact that they're playing Florida, and this is why seeds matter, by the way. Notre Dame is a six a lot of projections had them higher and guess what you get Winthrop which is getting a lot of respect a very dangerous number 11 seed and I think the winner of that 7-10 game between Vegas and Georgia Tech is going to have a very good chance to beat Wisconsin. Well I tell you what Oregon started to play basketball the last weekend as they played it early in the season very dangerous team high octane offense aggressive at the defensive end they're a team to keep an eye on in that bottom part of the bracket. Nothing like a bunch of dangerous teams in the same bracket will reveal the West region when the NCAA basketball championship selection show continues live on CBS. Welcome back to the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. Here's a look now at the tournament brackets from the NCAA and its corporate champion AT&T. And here is the West region. These games will be played in Chicago, March 16 and 18. The number one seed in this region, the Kansas Jayhawks, won the Big 12 regular season championship and the Big 12 tournament championship. They have two national titles under their belt. They will play the winner of the opening round game Tuesday night in Dayton, Ohio, between the Rattlers of Florida. Florida A&M, who won the MEAC tournament on a last-second shot, and the Purple Eagles of Niagara, who got an automatic bid through the MAC tournament championship. They'll come in on an 11-game winning streak. Number eight seed, Kentucky. Coach Tubby Smith makes it 14 straight tournament appearances, seven national titles for the Wildcats. They will meet another set of Wildcats. Villanova, the number nine seed. They won it all back in 1985. They've won eight of their last 11 games and the Villanova Wildcats looking on and knowing that they're going to play the Kentucky Wildcats in the first round. In Columbus, Ohio, March 16 and March 18, the number five seed, the Hokies of Virginia Tech. Fine season in the ACC at 21 and 11. They will play the Fighting Illini. People wondering if Illinois had enough to make this field. They did indeed. They finished winning eight of their last 12 games. Number four seed, the Salukis of Southern Illinois coming out of the Missouri Valley Conference. That's the first team out of the Missouri Valley. Missouri Valley, the Salukis won the regular season championship and lost the tournament championship game to Creighton. The number 13 seed, the team they will meet will be the Crusaders of Holy Cross, the automatic bid having won the Patriot League tournament championship. So it'll be SIU and Holy Cross. March 15 and 17 in Sacramento, California now. We talked to Ben Holland earlier, wondering where he's going to end up. He's the number two seed in this region. Pac-10 title, regular season championship, 11 national championships overall. They'll meet the Wildcats of Weber State, the number 15 seed. They come in as champions of the Big Sky Tournament. The number seven seed, the Hoosiers of Indiana. Kelvin Sampson in his first year at Bloomington. And his Indiana Hoosiers are in five national championships to the Hoosiers' credit. That's the fourth Big Ten team into the tournament. They will play the champions from the West Coast Conference, the Bulldogs of Gonzaga. Gonzaga, the number 10 seed. In Buffalo, New York, on March 15 and 17, the third Big East team into the tournament, the Pitt Panthers at 27 and 7. Lost the Big East Tournament Championship game to Georgetown, but there are the Pittsburgh Panthers and their faithful. With good reason, look forward to the tournament. They will play the 14th seeded Raiders of Wright State, the second team out of the Horizon League. They share the regular season title with Butler, and they won their conference tournament. 
The Duke Blue Devils, fourth team out of the ACC. They are the number six seed. Coach Mike Krzyzewski winning his coach in tournament history. And who will the Blue Devils meet? The Rams of Virginia Commonwealth, the second team into this tournament out of the Colonial League. Coach Anthony Grant in his first season won CAA Coach of the Year honors. They won their tournament championship, and they are going up to meet the Duke Blue Devils. Congratulations to them, and let's take a look at this one now and figure out what we see. Well, I tell you what, it's interesting. When you look at some of these matchups that we're going to see in these brackets based on the competitive balance across the country, I mean, my goodness, Kentucky, Villanova, then you've got Virginia Tech and Illinois, Virginia Tech, terrific backcourt. Xavier Dowdell, terrific guy who control, control the game. Southern Illinois, you thought they might be a four seed, Seth, and that's exactly where they ended up. Yeah, pretty good day so far for the Big Ten. Illinois and Purdue both getting in. I think Villanova's going to beat Kentucky in a pretty good 8-9 game. Villanova can really score the ball. Look at the bottom of the bracket. Boy, those VCU Rams look pretty happy to get the Duke Blue Devils, didn't they? Duke a little bit higher than I uh, anticipated as a six seed, and I actually think that's a pretty good matchup for them, though they lose at Pittsburgh. And how about the Sweet Six matchup. Pittsburgh against UCLA. Ben Howland oh. against his old school. Oh, Jamie Dixon. It's Phil and Clark. Pittsburgh against UCLA. Don't even worry about well, the first about, two rounds. What about the potential Gonzaga-UCLA rematch from last year in the tournament? That'd be pretty interesting, but I'm looking forward to that sweep. Come on, he's playing his old school. His protege, Jamie yeah. Dixon. That's an uncomfortable situation in the tournament. All right, guys, we remind you, you can run your brackets online for free with Bracket Manager on CBS Sportsline. Invite your friends, fill out a bracket, and let Bracket Manager do the rest. Sign up now at cbssportsline.com slash brackets when we come back we will reveal the east region after this message and a word from your local station welcome back to new york as we continue live on the ncaa basketball championship selection show right now a look at the tournament brackets from the ncaa and its corporate champion pontiac as we run down the east region these games march 15 and 17 in winston-salem north carolina you don't think they're going to be happy to see the North Carolina Tar Heels coming to town? The fifth team out of the ACC. Tar Heels won a share of the regular season title with Virginia, and they won the, the uh, tournament championship for national titles to their credit. They meet the Colonels of Eastern Kentucky, champions of the Ohio Valley Conference. The Marquette Golden Eagles are the number eight seed and the fourth team out of the Big East. One national title for them back in Atlanta 30 years ago, and they will meet the Spartans of Michigan State, the fifth Big Ten team in, the ninth seed. They won it all back in the year 2000. In Spokane, Washington on March 16 and 18, the Trojans of USC, the fourth team out of the Pac-10 and the number five seed in the region. They lost the Pac-10 final to Oregon, but they are poised to head out to Spokane where they will meet the Arkansas Razorbacks who showed well in the SEC championships in the tournament. Third team out of the SEC. From the Big 12, the Texas Longhorns lost the Big 12 tournament title and led by Big 12 Player of the Year, Kevin Durant. They will meet the 13th seed Aggies of New Mexico State out of the WAC, the automatic bid with the WAC Tournament Championship. Now, March 15 and 17 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, it'll be the number two seeded Hoyas of Georgetown. Fifth team out of the Big East. Boy, did they come on strong. Winners of 15 of their last 16 games. They won the Big East title. They will play champions of the Atlantic Sun, the Bruins of Belmont, the number 15 seed, 23 and nine overall. The ACC brings a sixth team in. That's the Eagles of Boston College, the number seven seed. D.C. finished the season uh, winning or losing five of their last seven games. They will play the Red Raiders of Texas Tech, the number 10 seed, third team out of the Big 12, Bob Knight and company coming into the tournament. In Sacramento, California, March 15 and 17, the Cougars of Washington State are the fifth team out of the Pac-10, and they are the number three seed. They will play the Golden Eagles of Oral Roberts, champions of the mid-continent regular season and tournament. The number four seed, the Commodore, number six seed rather, the Commodores of Vanderbilt, the fourth team out of the SEC. They ended Florida's 17-game winning streak in February, you might recall. They'll meet the Colonials of George Washington, won the automatic bid coming out of the Atlantic 10. So, as we check out this region now, shoot. Well, I tell you what, how about the first round matchup? Marquette from the Big East, Michigan State from the Big Ten. I mean, two teams that um, had, had their bumps, but every team did. And then how about Arkansas? Apparently, as you said, Greg, 
making a strong run in the SEC postseason tournament, got them in just under the wire as an at-large. Welcome to Hollywood, Razorbacks. And by the way, you can put that buyout money away down in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Stan Heath took the Hogs to the tournament. He deserves another year. Congratulations to those guys. And how about North Carolina's potential road to a Final Four? Potentially Marquette, Texas, and then one of the best two seeds I've ever seen <laughs> in Georgetown. I actually like Texas into the Elite Eight, and I'm calling an upset right now. Number 14 seed, or Oral you're Roberts. on that Remember, they or are you? They what? won at Kansas. I like them to beat Washington State. I think this uh, side of the bracket, Clark, sets up very favorably for Georgetown. I think it's an easy ride for them to be lead eight. Well, I don't know about that, but clearly they're a team that's a tough matchup for everybody. I like Vanderbilt. A lot of people haven't seen them play. They've got a terrific player, and Derek Byers having a phenomenal year. Keep an eye on Vanderbilt. I agree. All yeah, right, Sweet 16. Now that the brackets are being set, it's time to watch for the Pontiac game-changing performances. Plays where momentum changes and outcomes can be decided after each round you go to ncaasports.com slash Pontiac and vote for a nominated play on March the 28th see the four finalists and help decide which school wins a $100,000 scholarship from Pontiac for the game-changing performance of the tournament by season's end Pontiac will have contributed over one million dollars to schools over the past three years it's what makes Pontiac the official performance machine of the NCAA there is just one region remaining, and that's the South. Several teams and their loyal fans are anxiously awaiting word. That includes the Drexel Dragons. Are they in or are they out? And how about the Mountaineers of West Virginia? They're eager to learn if they're in or out. And Memphis. We know Memphis is in, but who will the Conference USA champions face? We'll find all of that out in a moment when the selection show continues here on CBS. Welcome back to our studios here in New York, everyone. Here's a look at the tournament brackets from the ACC and its corporate champions as we reveal the fourth and final bracket, the South Region. These games will be played in Lexington, Kentucky, March 15 and 17. That's where the top seed in the South, the Ohio State Buckeyes, will play. Big Ten Coach of the Year, Thad Mata and his champions from the Big Ten Conference. They are, uh, yeah, they knew they were headed there. And who are you going to play, guys? How about number 16 seed Blue Devils of Central Connecticut State, the regular season and tournament champs from the Northeastern Conference. The number eight seed Cougars of BYU, the second team out of the Mountain West. They lost the Mountain West final to UNLV and they will play the second team out of the Atlantic 10. The Musketeers of Xavier won the A-10 regular season championship, won nine of their last 10 games coming into the tournament. In Columbus, Ohio, on March 16 and 17, the number five seed, the Volunteers of Tennessee. Coach Bruce Pearl, 22 wins this season. They won seven of their last nine games, fifth team out of the SEC, and they will play the 49ers of Long Beach State. This team started two and four, won 22 of their last 25. The fourth seed, Virginia Cavaliers, the seventh team out of the ACC. They will meet the number 13 seed, Great Danes of Albany, the champions of the America East Tournament, and the Great Danes all excited and ready to take on the Cavaliers of Virginia. In New Orleans, Louisiana, March 16 and March 18th, the number two seed, Memphis Tigers. That's where John Calipari and his crew are headed. Headed there with the automatic berth from the uh, championship of Conference USA. And the question is who they'll play. How about the champions out of the Sun Belt? The Mean Green of North Texas making their first tournament appearance since 1988. They won the Sun Belt tournament title. The number seven seed, the Wolf Pack of Nevada and the second team out of the WAC conference. They won the regular season WAC title and Wolf Pack sitting around looking around and go, oh, here we are. And who are you going to play? You're going to play the Creighton Blue Jays, the second team out of the Missouri Valley Conference. They upset Southern Illinois to win the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament. And they're the number 10 Creighton Blue Jays and their fans finishing a great season at 22 and 10. March 15th and 17th now in Lexington, Kentucky, the Aggies of Texas A&M out of the Big 12, the fourth team out of the Big 12, 25 and 6 as they sit around and wait for their name to be called. And now it is. Who will they play? How about the Quakers of Pennsylvania? The automatic berth by virtue of their championship in the Ivy League. Three straight Ivy League titles under their belt. The sixth team out of the Big East, the Louisville Cardinals. 
Coach Rick Pitino, the only coach to take three teams to the Final Four, two championships under Louisville's belt. They will play the Stanford Cardinal, the sixth team out of the Pac-10. They lost four of their last five games. They won the title back in 1942, but that rounds out the entire bracket. So talk to me, guys. Well, you look at Xavier. They, they're in Cincinnati and Ohio State. They could very well meet in the second round matchup right there in Lexington, not very far to travel. And Brigham Young, very interesting team. A lot of people may not have seen them. They're big. They're pretty mobile, athletic. That should be an interesting matchup. Looking forward to that. And then you think about Tennessee. A healthy James Lofton, one of the terrific shooters in college basketball, makes them dangerous. You know, we've seen Ohio State's got problems scoring, Clark. I've seen a lot of good offensive teams in that bracket. Tennessee being one of them, that'd be a very dangerous matchup up for Ohio State and then uh, when you go down to the bottom of the bracket and you know I have to know two teams not in this bracket not in this tournament Drexel and how about Syracuse being left out what a shock there and uh, Nevada I think is a sleeper and uh, Memphis uh, you know earning that number two seed I had them as a three but again for uh, Syracuse and Drexel yeah, to be surprised. left out of the tournament Drexel really bothers me I have to tell you because they're a mid-major team that has to go on the road yeah. to upgrade their schedule they did what they were supposed to do and they won a lot of road games they still got left out that's yeah. wrong here are the top four seeds uh, the top in each region Region, the Sweet 16, if you will, at least as we get started. Well, you take a look at that East region. I mean, North Carolina, Georgetown, Texas, a dangerous team with perhaps the player of the year, most likely the player of the year, and Kevin Durant, Washington State, a little under the radar. Nice, strong seed for them. Very solid, experienced basketball team there. That's a tough just, bracket. Just, just looking at that grouping, I think Florida has the smoothest pass to Atlanta. Obviously, nothing comes easy in this tournament. Right. But you look at North Carolina paired with Georgetown. Texas, an incredibly strong four. I told you about Ohio State and the offensive teams in that region, and uh, boy, Kansas, UCLA, Pittsburgh, Southern Illinois, Southern Illinois, I think that's your uh, toughest bracket. And, and there you see it, Greg, the conference breakdown. I'm very surprised about Syracuse get, getting left out. Very disappointed that Drexel gets left out, leaving the Colonial only with two teams. But all in all, I think you've seen a lot of teams in there outside of the uh, major conference. And perhaps the Arkansas run in the postseason conference tournament bump one of those teams, and that happens um, the last weekend. We, were, we weren't even saying Syracuse on the bubble, and here they were apparently the last team in. Well, that's why we're here and there in the, that's right. in the room. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, the, the available at-large bids, 28 from the power conferences and six from the non-power conferences. And the at-large bids, I don't know, surprise you? Not nearly as many. Yeah, it was a little surprising. I thought there would be more. It seemed like that, but as the season played out and things changed in a fluid situation, but I'm a little surprised. I thought there would be eight, maybe nine. You know what? Look large at bids the, from the non-power power conference. I'm sorry, Cluck. Look at that trend line. 12, 9, 8, 6. That is bad for college basketball. It's bad for the tournament. The mid-majors are the teams that give the tournament uh, its charm. And again, that is so hard for them to upgrade the schedule. They deserve more bids. Last second invites, Cluck. Well, you've got one there in, in terms of a non-power conference in Old Dominion, but again, I think Arkansas played themselves into a position. Stanford, a little stronger resume than some of the others, so it's debatable, but that's the way it is. And they shall all have to play at Drexel next year. Yeah, sure. <laughs> all right, as for those teams that are left on the outside looking in, uh, all of a sudden, you know, Clark, uh, our Seth is the, uh, the the band leader for Drexel, and, and, and rightly so, because yeah, sure. there would be a he lot of people wondering why this team didn't get in, but Syracuse, Air Force, Missouri State, I know Missouri State right. was a favorite Missouri State Europe. and Drexel were the teams I thought would get in over Stanford and Illinois. And you thought Florida State would be a, a tournament I team. thought they would have a chance, but they played themselves into position to be left out, so I can't really complain about that. But I'll tell you what, I'm sure that Jim Beheim and company are shocked that they are out of this term. All right, guys, uh, we're going to take another look through the uh, through the brackets with Jim and Billy back in Chicago. They are standing by, Jim. All right, thank you, Greg. We're going to go right through all the sites, and Billy will begin again with the team that has been established as the team to beat the number one overall seed of the tournament, Florida. As you take a look, they're playing in New Orleans. Uh, starting on Friday against Jackson State. That 8-9 game is Arizona against Purdue. Arizona took on all comers this year. Early in the year beat Memphis. Scheduled North Carolina. Purdue was a bubble team and got a 9. By the way, Jim, a little history made. Lute Olson now ties Dean Smith. This is his 23rd straight NCAA tournament. Quite an accomplishment. They've played a very difficult schedule. I look for them to play much better in the NCAA tournament. And how about Butler and Old Dominion? Two of the mid-major at larges are going to meet in the first round. Butler and ODU. Meanwhile, Take a look at this part of the Midwest. Notre Dame against Winthrop. Winthrop, it's been a lot of talk the what, last what, week about what Winthrop. What seed was George Mason? 
both. They were an 11. That's right. And yep. I think Winthrop is this year's George Mason. I've seen them play on numerous occasions. That is a powerful team with tournament experience. UNLV and Georgia Tech played in the national semifinals back in 1990. They will meet again in Chicago. Wisconsin's going to travel the 146 miles from Madison to come here in the first week of the tournament. Meanwhile, in the West, well, look at this. Bill Self comes back to Big Ten country as the number one seed in that West bracket. Kentucky Villanova. Villanova was in, well, they won their championship in Kentucky's uh, home arena there, and they'll take on the Wildcats in the first round. And, you know, Tubby Smith, after a very disappointing overall season and uh, what happened in the SEC tournament, needs to turn that thing around. And Virginia Tech, a five, and Illinois, one of the last teams in, gets in as a 12. We saw them yesterday with not very impressive performance. All right, Duke against uh, VCU and Pitt and Wright State. Now, Wright State wins the automatic by beating Butler. Butler merits a five as an at-large. Wright State a 14 with the automatic. What do you see down the line there for Duke? Well, I think that the, the situation for Duke is that they, this year, found themselves without the type of personnel that could put them in what we usually see as certainly a one or two seed. Uh, this is going to be a tough situation for Mike Krzyzewski. I think VCU is a real challenge for him in the opening round. How about the oddity? Indiana and Gonzaga meet in the, in the tournament for the second straight year. And UCLA, of course, the two in the West. Let's take a look at the East. This bracket appears to be loaded. North Carolina against Eastern Kentucky. How do you like the Marquette-Michigan State 8-9 game? Uh, great quickness and, and explosive scoring power by Marquette. Michigan State, an excellent rebounding team, wants to play a little closer to the vest. That'll be an interesting ball game. And Texas possibly against USC in the second round. Let's bring back Reggie Bush, Matt Leinert, and Vincent Young. <laughs> All right. A lot of explosive scoring in this region. Also in the East, in the top games here up in Sacramento, Vandy against George Washington, one of the Calhoun assistants there. Yeah, we mentioned that today. Four of Jim Calhoun's former assistants are bringing teams in the NCAA tournament. Jim finds himself out. And meanwhile, look at this, a possible old Big East matchup, Boston College and Georgetown in the possible second round. But you got Bobby Knight there as a 10. His team Yesterday got we heard Bobby Knight uh, uh, campaigning for Bob Huggins. Huggins out, Knight in. How about I wonder that? if that was a little reflection. And finally, let's take a look at the South. How about it's interesting, Ohio State ends up being in the South while Florida is in the Midwest. And you see the Buckeyes will take on Howie Dickman's Blue Devils of Central Connecticut Another State. Jim Calhoun assistant, former assistant. And BYU Xavier 8-9 game. The Virginia gets themselves a four seed. Uh, the ACC is strongly represented in, the, in that position. Also in the South bracket, the and bottom Jim, side Jim, of that bracket. How about Albany? All the way to a 13. I'm really that? happy for them. Uh, they played well last Last year and, and really showed that maybe a 16 can pull something off. Yep. Last year they pushed to UConn they to the end. Did. They led with 11 minutes to go. Louisville will be traveling just 70 something miles over to Lexington. How about that? A, a great coaching job this year by Rick Pitino. We saw them early. They were really struggling. What a great job he did to turn that thing around. And Stanford, a very, very dangerous team. A lot of size. All right, Billy, we're going to come back and uh, visit with Gary Walters in, in just a moment. But that's another look at the brackets. Greg, let's head it back to you in New York. Jim, Billy, thank you. Yeah, don't go anywhere. We'll be talking live with the man who oversaw that selection process. Gary Walters joins us shortly. Plus, our guys will have some predictions to help you fill out your brackets when we continue on CBS in just a moment. NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show is sponsored by DiGiorno. It's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. Cisco, welcome to the Human Network. And powered by Pontiac, official performance machines of the NCAA. A reminder for you, here's a tip if you're stuck in the office this week, can't get to a TV, sign up for the NCAA March Madness On Demand and watch the men's tournament online. Get your free VIP pass now at NCAAsports.com slash MMOD. Welcome back, everyone. Joining us now live from Indianapolis is Gary Walters, chair of the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Committee and director of athletics at Princeton University. Gary, welcome. For a while there, we were wondering if we were going to get the brackets at all. I imagine these late games didn't do you any favors, but... Tell us how things uh, eventually shook out for you. Well, uh, Greg, I think the first thing I want to do is just congratu congratulate all of the student athletes who played Division I NCAA basketball this past year leading up to what will be the culmination of March Madness. I also want to express my uh, sincere empathy uh, for those bubble teams that didn't make it in. Uh, having said all that, uh, one of the uh, 
themes has been parody and to underscore uh, the fact that parody has come home to roost, we actually had 104 teams this past year that won 20 uh, or more games. Uh, that's more than the, the previous high of 78. So it will give people some idea as to the challenges facing the committee. All right, Gary. Jim and Billy out in Chicago. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and Gary, first off, I know this had more complexities this year than any other, not only at the top of the brackets and the top seeds, but the last teams in as well. And one little last thing you had to work your way through was the Big 12 final. If Kansas had lost that game to Texas, would that have moved UCLA up to the one line, dropping Kansas back to a two? Yes, uh, we had made a, a decision uh, this afternoon, and it was a contingency decision, that indeed uh, we were not going to move Kansas had they lost uh, in the uh, uh, conference tournament final. The very fact that they had gotten to the final, had won the regular season, uh, represented for us uh, the necessary bona fides to stay on the first line. You know, there was a lot of talk all week about Old Dominion and Drexel. Would they get two teams in, three teams in from the Colonial, the George Mason uh, Conference that, of course, last year made its way all the way to the, to the Final Four? What was the ultimate decider, ODU getting in and Drexel being left out? Boy, it was a very tough decision. Um, you know, both teams just have performed admirably throughout the year. Uh, we were very much aware of the uh, uh, very good road record uh, that Drexel had. But what impressed us more was the fact that within the conference, uh, uh, ODU had uh, just performed really admirably and uh, had come in second in the league and uh, had a better uh, uh, interconference record by a significant margin. Gary, we left uh, you on actually Tuesday afternoon and uh, knew you were heading out to uh, Indianapolis to get started. When you arrived there, how many teams were fighting for that uh, first line? It seems like right up to the last minute it could be changing. How many really had a chance on Tuesday? Well, I think that all you have to do, Billy, is look at the first uh, two lines in particular to give you some idea as to uh, who was fighting for a, a number one seed. Uh, clearly things were fluid. We had talked about that. Uh, but uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, three teams uh, Ohio State, Florida, uh, North Carolina had won both their regular season uh, uh, conference play and then won their tournaments. And then also given the fact that Kansas had won the regular season and had gone to the final, made our job easier as it related to selecting the top line. You know, one of the things last year seemed like it caught fire, and that was the mid-majors and the great impact that George Mason had. Last year, there were eight mid-major teams picked at large. This year, just six. I think you kind of let us in a little bit in the fact that this is a trend that doesn't necessarily mean last year was the beginning of something new. And obviously, this year, it, went, it dropped back. What was the reason for that? Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, every year uh, we look at, uh, you know, uh, selecting teams. We start with a clean slate. And uh, our job is to uh, recognize that once conference play is over, we're, you know, every team becomes an independent. And so our job is to compare and contrast all the teams regardless of conference affiliation. We adhere to that principle. Some years you have uh, the so-called mid-majors that end up with more teams in the tournament. Some, te some years you have fewer teams in the tournament. Frankly, it wasn't until the end of uh, selection that we actually asked the question, how did this all shake out? And it was uh, the last question that I know that I asked, and we found out that there were six. So, um, you know, we'll, we still believe that we'll have great representation from the mid-majors, not only as it relates to the at-large teams that are in the tournament, but also from the automatic qualifiers. Billy and I had alluded to it during the weekend that usually it's one or the other. The, the bubble situation is always something of great debate, but you often have, you know, the top teams, two or three ones kind of locked in. What was harder for the committee this year to figure out the number one seeds or the top one and two seeds or the bottom half of the, of the whole bracket? I, I think by far, uh, Jim, the toughest thing was selecting the last three or four uh, at large teams. Uh, we spent just a considerable amount of time, um, you know, over the course of almost two or three days uh, discussing uh, those at, at large uh, teams. And it wasn't easy. We had unbelievably rigorous and robust debate. 
Uh, and so that was really where the focus was and, and really where the difficulty was, uh, as I alluded to, because of the number of teams with uh, uh, very good records. Gary, one of the things that jumped out at all of us over the course of the year were the unbalanced schedules. So I want to take two teams in the same league, Texas Tech and Kansas State. Uh, Texas Tech in with Bobby Knight, Bobby Huggins out with Kansas State. What was the deciding factor there between those two teams that obviously had to be going down to the wire? Well, Bill, that's an interesting observation, and clearly unbalanced schedules did come into play. We talked about it earlier, and more and more leagues have unbalanced schedules, which clearly makes uh, our job uh, more difficult. Uh, we were impressed by the fact that Texas Tech uh, had beaten, uh, you know, Texas A&M uh, twice. They had beaten Kansas. Uh, they had a, a couple nice wins outside of the league. Uh, and we're playing in the uh, uh, Southern Division of the Big 12, which was viewed as the uh, tougher division, and it had also beaten Kansas State in a regular season head-to-head. -head. Uh, as it turns out, they, they ended up getting seated because they were in the tougher division and had to play uh, uh, a game on uh, uh, one game the night before they played Kansas State in the tournament, and so the general feeling was that when you, when you looked at it, it was a very, very close call. Uh, but we really felt that Texas Tech uh, merited inclusion. Hey, Gary, real quick, uh, Syracuse wins 10 games in the conference and 22 games overall left out. What happened, if you can tell us in 10 seconds? Well, I, you know, it's, it's what I said earlier. I mean, we just had all of these teams bunched uh, where we were trying to decide, uh, you know, who were the w most worthy teams uh, to get in the tournament at the end. And it's not only Syri Syracuse. I have empathy for any number of teams that were on the bubble uh, that didn't get in. Hey, Gary, congratulations, though, to you and the committee sorting all of this out in a year that I think may have been the most difficult of all. Great job on their part. And we'll see you on the road to the final Thanks four, Gary. Thank you very Thanks much. We lot, both Jim. agree Thanks that the lot, East Billy. looks like the... Yep, thank you. The East looks, Greg, to be the most uh, difficult of all of them, but they are all very well balanced. I think balanced, but I think the East really has some power there when you talk about North Carolina, Georgetown, and Texas all in that top four. That's pretty strong. Back to you, Greg, in New York. All right, guys, thank you. We'll let you get set for tournament play beginning on Thursday of this week. It's one of these, it's one of these things that you're never, ever, ever going to decide on. There's no definitive answer between the power teams and the non-power teams, but it's something we were talking about on our way to the studio. Well, it's something to debate, but it's been worked out. We've got the field. It's relatively balanced, and you can't argue other than Syracuse Drexel, perhaps, but other than that, I think it's um, pretty solid. Let's and we take talk a look. about who you are. Oh, well, I've been... Talking about Florida and Seth has finally joined me in that regard. I'll agree, I'll agree with you, but I will disagree with you on your champion, my champion for 2007. The Kansas Jayhawks had him at the start of the year. I jumped well, off that bandwagon well. fast. I am back on. I think Bill Self and his guys are going to win the national championship. And uh, I'll agree with you here. Part This is scary. I this is bad news for these teams that we're agreeing so much, but I love well, the Hoyas. Well, I think it's just a tough matchup. When you look at the size, versatility, athleticism of the Georgetown Hoyas, that's, um, that's going to be a challenge for whoever they face. All right, and what about out of the South? This last one? Who's the one seed in the South? Anybody know by any chance? Yeah, I like the Buckeyes, not uh, just because that happens to be my alma yes. mater, but they are playing well, and they have terrific talent, and they seem to be getting better at the right time. They're a great team. They won a lot of games in a row. I just think Texas A&M is uh, a little bit too tough defensively. I like AC Lawn Company. To Sleepers, march guys. Off. Well, I like Notre Dame because they have the ability to shoot and score the ball, and that's always a great attribute, especially when you're in a tournament situation. Yeah, a lot of people are going to like Winthrop against Notre Dame, by the way. I disagree. Uh, I like Notre Dame to win that game. And Georgia Tech is a young team growing up, much like Louisville has uh, throughout the course of the season. Interesting that Gonzaga has been somewhere in the top five lines of the bracket in recent years. Now they're a 10 seed. They've gone through some adversity this year. Good backcourt there. I think they've got a chance to maybe make some people um, take I, notice of it. I certainly like Gonzaga over Indiana. Southern Illinois maybe cheat a little bit as a four seed as a sleeper, but uh, I think they have a chance to advance. And there's another uh, four seed sleeper, Texas. I list them as a sleeper only because I have them going to the Elite Eight, beating North Carolina oh, in the Sweet 16. Well, with Kevin Durant and the rest of that crew, I don't, I don't disagree with you there. And then Vanderbilt, two outstanding players in Shane Foster, Derek Byers, Nevada, Nick Fazekas, Marcellus Kemp, Ramon Sessions, and the I rest of the Nevada. Wolfpack. I love Tennessee. Watch out for Louisville playing in Lexington, getting a home court advantage.
Are you sure about all this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, Chris it Lofton depends. For Tennessee, it depends. Outstanding can we shoot? watch games now? All please? right. Now games? that the brackets are set and you know the who, you can find out the whys and the what ifs. Coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, live on our sister station, CSTV. CSTV is the place for college sports 24 hours a day. Remember, the first round of the NCAA tournament takes place this Thursday and Friday. Our coverage begins at noon Eastern with the first tip slated for about 12.15. We'll also have live primetime coverage beginning at 7 Eastern Time right here on CBS. Come